Um, well, I will now present uh, some aspects of uh, what we have been looking at uh, where it concerns uh, population estimates of the Limes area and potential dynamics of the population uh, in the area. Uh, I titled uh, the talk From Population Dynamics to Settlement Patterns, but I guess what I'm presenting is more the other way around. And yeah, the subtitle, Linking Archaeological Data to Demographic Models, I think Isabel just uh, very neatly explained how complex th this is. And it is obviously something that uh, we ran into as well. And uh, yeah, I started out as a complete uh, non expert in demography. Uh, I've read up quite a bit on it and I think it's a really interesting uh, subject but I still wouldn't consider myself as someone who knows an awful lot about it so if there are any kind of mistakes or issues in the talk uh, well that's basically because of that. Uh, uh, so what I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about is uh, what we know in the area from archaeological and historical evidence or what has been suggested in the past uh, about the population living especially the population size that we're talking about I will give you uh, an example of how we tried to detect the population trend uh, from the archaeological site inventory, or better said, the settlement density trend that we think we can see now. And this also ties in very much, I think, to what uh, Tyler already said about uh, yeah, huge data sets that you want to analyze and uh, try to figure out what is where, when. And then I will also present at the end a small dynamical modeling model of household demographics and basically this was to see what would happen if you would introduce a uh, external factor into a natural uh, situation in this case this is the recruitment of batavian soldiers uh, in the area so these are sort of connected but they are not completely linked yet and i'm don't even know if they can be all linked yet but uh, there's a lot of potential there i think for uh, for further research as well so if we look at published estimates of the rural population size in the area, this, so this is the people that lived outside the towns and the forts, uh, there are some basic assumptions that have been uh, suggested, like that each household, each farm had between five and eight persons living there. It has also been suggested that uh, the actual density of settlement in the area might have been between one and two settlements per square kilometer, and these settlements would on average have anywhere between 1.5 or 3 to 4 households or farms per settlement. If you calculate uh, these figures over the whole area, uh, and you see this is split between the Batavians and the Kananafats, uh, then uh, yeah, you can see that the estimates for the Roman period, most probably reflecting the Middle Roman period, so the uh, the height of uh, population density. Uh, yeah, they are quite different and they have quite quite a big range. Uh, for the Western area, it is clear that the number of people living there was considerably lower than uh, for the Eastern Batavian area. And yeah, for the Batavian area, the uh, low figure uh, was uh, based on yeah the archaeological site data that was known in the early 1980s. And the 2003 estimate is actually based on a very uh, densely populated uh, micro-region that was extrapolated to the rest of the area, resulting in a much larger number of people. And Nico, in his first talk, uh, already suggested that the number of people might be somewhere around 40,000 for the Batavians. <laughs> well, it fits, sort of, but yeah, it's not really uh, a very narrow range that we're talking about. Uh, talking about military recruitment, uh, obviously this has also been used to try to estimate the potential uh, size of the population. Again, departing from a, a theoretical uh, contingent of about 5,000 or maybe in a later stage 5,500 Batavian soldiers, this would imply that uh, about 1.2 to 1.5 males per household were needed every 20 years. And this would also result in figures that are yeah, sort of comparable, although for the Kananifechian area this would uh, imply a much lower figure because uh, they were supposed to only, uh, s uh, only uh, deliver one uh, cohort, so about uh, 960 soldiers to the Roman army. And then 
Uh, you could also look at carrying capacity estimates. Uh, well, the only one I could find actually was uh, also done by uh, Bloomers in 1978. And so these are the kind of estimates that have been uh, produced in the past. And yeah, if you now look at what we have uh, in terms of archaeological data, then uh, there's quite a bit that has been uh, collected over the past 20 years, mostly uh, triggered by uh, contract-based archaeology. Uh, there have been some studies that actually try to collect these for micro-regions. The study by Willems, already mentioned, was the first one, I think, that tried to actually get all this data together. Uh, Wouter Voss has published his PhD uh, on the area around Utrecht. Uh, Ivo Vossen uh, also collected a lot of data on the Batavian area. Uh, Marike van Dinter did the same for her study. And there are lots of local records as well. For example, the municipality of The Hague has uh, quite a substantial database online. And then there is the National Archaeological Database System, Argis, <coughs> where if you only search for Roman sites, you will find over 30,000 records, uh, not to mention all the grey literature reports that are also included in the dance repository. So it's a lot, and uh, people always say, well, in my area, I know there are other sites. Uh, yes, there are. Yeah. I immediately agree there are, but yeah, because of the size of the data set, uh, I decided to limit what I wanted to do to the publicly accessible data, which already was quite a bit. Uh, well, the first question, basically going back already to uh, how Willem Willems approached this in the uh, 1980s was, uh, yeah, when are you actually talking about a Roman archaeological site that could qualify as a potential settlement? The basic criterion applied at the time was that uh, yeah, you needed to have at least a certain number of shirts that were dated Roman. Uh, ten or more. These needed to be found in close proximity and yeah, sometimes you would also have uh, real clear diagnostic materials, specific signs of uh, finds, specific soil layers that would allow you to say, okay, well, people actually lived here. But as uh, Wouter Voss uh, remarked in his study, he said, well, okay, uh, people have done this a lot of time, but uh, it seems that they have not been actually comparing uh, studies. Uh. So, you end up with data coming from various sources that, as everybody knows, has lots of yeah, potential uncertainties or uh, flaws, like uh, is the location correctly uh, registered? Uh, what is the actual chronology of the finds we're looking at? Uh, what kind of function might this site have had? And uh, a question that often pops up, where is the documentation? Uh, not always that easy to find. Uh, so what? I did basically was just to yeah, go through all this data, uh, these 13,000 plus uh, sites, uh, working also on the basis of uh, the published inventories that I, that I uh, told you about and try to reduce the actual site database to something that we might be reasonably confident of uh, that would only contain settlement sites. Uh, I ended up with more or less 1,100 uh, settlements based on what we got out of uh, the national database and from the excavation reports when they were there. And these are yeah, given a very basic interpretation like rural settlement, uh, military site, uh, infrastructure, stuff like that, based on yeah, really what was there in the, in the database, so not on a reanalysis of, uh, of the finds. Uh, however, we did, uh, I did uh, link all this to the actual available information, so anyone who would like to use it in a later stage uh, will be able to see, okay, where did this come from? Because that was really something that I found really difficult uh, many times to figure out, okay, why was this actually considered as a settlement site or not? So this will be one of the end products of the project, actually, uh, to have this database uh, available to, uh, to other researchers as well. Now, obviously, when I have this, I can do the same kind of game with the uh, settlement densities and try to figure out what kind of figures I would get as a population estimate. Um, looking at the excavated sites, uh, a total of slightly over 180, which is quite a lot, actually. They've not all been excavated in the same amount of detail. But, yeah, at least they usually have some kind of registration of the number of plans that have been uncovered. Uh, these might not all be contemporaneous. Uh, some have been specifically uh, identified as house plans. Others have been identified as just a plan. 
So, taking the leap of faith and saying, well, this says maybe something about the number of uh, households uh, in the settlement, you can then uh, make the same kind of calculations. And yeah, this very, very rough calculation tells me that uh <coughs> Within the uh, available excavation data, we would have uh, a number of people living probably between roughly 2,500 and 4,500. So if you would extrapolate it to all the settlement sites that we now have in the database, this would lead to a potential rural population of somewhere between 13,500 and 26,500. Again, uh, this is not the whole story. Uh, there's also other data. Uh, we have the forts and the uh, military settlements, the Viki, that are uh, associated with it. Uh, we don't actually know the exact number of forts. Uh, uh, we count between 16 and 21, probably closer to 21 than to 16. And the Viki that were supposed to be uh, uh, next to every fort, we haven't found all of them. So, yeah, I've been very... Uh, cautious here not to overestimate the number of people and then there's also the point that in Novi Magus in Nijmegen in the middle Roman period for some time a complete legion was uh, stationed uh, with 5,000 <coughs> people so the military population fluctuates in time but okay you can say okay it's gonna be between that and that and then there are also a few civil settlements uh, two towns uh, like I said Novi Magus and Forum Hadriani with a fairly low population estimate uh, that I took from uh, the PhD thesis by Tom Buitenborp, so only 4,000 people, and maybe between f uh, maybe five other civil settlements. Uh, so you end up with these percentages uh, that tell you something about what's happening in the area, because the military population proportion is really quite substantial. Even uh, uh, if I sort of correct my figures and say, okay, well, the number of rural settlements is probably too low, the estimates, and I think it is because of the uh, fact that the uh, uh, ratio of town to rural is usually taken as 1 to 10, and now it is like 1 to 6. Uh <coughs> uh, yeah, the even then, uh, the amount of people that are associated with the military is substantial in the area, so that's something to, uh, to keep in mind. Now, <coughs> looking again at the archaeological survey data, um, yeah, we <coughs> were thinking about the chronology issue. If you look at what is in the national database, uh, then you see that more there are various ways of registering. Sometimes people don't count the number of shirts. Sometimes they are very unspecific in describing what they have found. And the system also has three levels of specificity of dating, which makes life a little bit more complicated. So you could have either <coughs> Iron Age Roman, you could have a distinction of three Roman periods or even six Roman periods. These all have their own uh, set uh, time span, which is different depending on uh, what period you're looking at. So, yeah, <coughs> if something is dated Middle Roman B, then it could cover 120 years. It is uh, dated Rome, Early Roman A, then it could cover only 37 years. Well, one way to deal with this, and this was uh, actually published by uh, Enrico Crema in 2012, I think, uh, is to try to divide the probability of dating in this kind of cases over the periods uh, considered. So if you would have a find that is dated anywhere between the Iron Age and the Roman period, so a total time span of 700 years, you could say, okay, well, the probability of this belonging to the Roman B period, uh, middle B period, is only 17%, and the probability of it belonging to the uh, early Roman A period only 5%, because the time span of that period is much shorter. And you could do the same with this other find and this other find that have different <coughs> datings. And then by adding this together, uh, you, ha you, uh, you end up with the what is called the aoristic sum of all these three finds. And then you could say, okay, well, actually the probability that none of these finds is coming from one of the six subperiods is the P0. So there is a probability of 78% percent in this case that none of these finds is actually coming from the early Roman A period and this drops uh, to 32 percent for the middle Roman A period and of course uh, the reciprocal is what is uh, 
over there uh, un in the last uh, row uh, telling me, okay, well, there is actually a probability of 68% that there, are, there is at least one find that actually comes from the Roman Middle A period. Now you can, uh, oh, only five. <laughs> You can extend this uh, to the whole data set, so I'm not going to uh, to do this for you at the moment. I just the here are the time spans and the number of finds. And then uh, basically uh, try to attribute uh, finds into each period uh, by simulating it. So if there is a probability of 68% that this belongs to a certain period, then in 68 of 100 simulations there will be a find uh, positioned in the Roman middle A period, and that is what you see here. And what we were interested in were the uh, cases where we have 10 or more finds actually belonging to a certain period, and for this particular case it seems that this only is valid for the Middle Roman A period, where in 41 out of uh, 1000 simulations we actually find 10 or more, 10 finds positioned in that period. So you can use this to actually look at the uh, at the development uh, through time. Number of finds here uh, for the whole area uh, is divided into different classes. You have to basically look at the red bars here that are the cases where there is a 50% or more chance that there will be 10 finds within the period. Uh, so these are basically the better dated sites and they show a clear increase in the Middle Roman period and a decrease in the Late Roman period. Um, similar uh, pattern actually occurring here if you look at an increase in number of finds then this is really the clearest for the Middle Roman period and if you look at the Late Roman period then there's a very clear decrease in finds. And also the number of sites that actually have 10 or more finds also shows a very similar pattern with, surprisingly, also uh, quite a large amount of continuity uh, even into the late, uh, late Roman period, which also tells you something uh, about what might have happened. Now when you compare this to the actual excavated sites, uh, you see that the information coming from there is much more skewed in a sense. I don't have a real explanation for this, uh, apart from the possibility that uh, the Roman, uh, that the survey sites dating uh, is really very, uh, very poor, uh, might be. Uh, but yeah, it changes the uh, picture a little bit, because if you look at the ex excavated sites, you would really expect there to be a very strong concentration in the Roman period and a complete decline in the late Roman period. And I don't think that is what we're seeing from the, uh, from the survey data. Okay, so I'm going to skip this. Thank you. Okay. Two more minutes, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, if we look at the demographic processes uh, and population growth, uh, annual increase of about 0.5% is something that on the basis of this seems quite plausible, uh, feasible, even when some people have discussed it, say, okay, it must have been less. But we also have to uh, take into account that we have this influx of soldiers and that we also have this urban population that has to come from somewhere. And yeah, how did this happen? The question that was just asked, uh, did life become healthier after the Romans came? Uh, did people change their reproductive behavior? Why did they do this? How big was the urban and rural migration? There are very few answers uh, to that. And then we have this recruitment case uh, in the Batavian area, which would reduce the actual uh, pool of, for of reproduction. So. Basically, uh, if we're looking at the recruitment, and Nico already discussed this, uh, then uh, yeah, the basic issue here is that uh, the idea is, at least from Roman sources, that these soldiers were not allowed to marry, so they were taken out of the reproductive pool. And I wanted to model this uh, yeah, in a more dynamical sense, see what would happen. So I set up a household reproduction model, used fertility estimates from historical evidence, uh, and experimenting a little bit with different mortality regimes, uh, among others the mortality regime just mentioned by, uh, by Isabel Sigi. Uh, we have assumed an age difference between marriage partners, so males had to be older than uh, females. This is something that is documented in Roman sources. And also setting up a recruitment rate that was fixed uh, for males between 18 and 25 years that were then taken out of the reproductive pool for 25 years. 
So if you so next unity, I wanted to have this run. Mm, yeah, there it goes. So just to see something moving today, <laughs> <laughs> this is how it goes in that logo. Basically, what I did here, I set the recruitment really high, and you see the population collapsing uh, very nicely, which is obviously what ESA was hoping for. So. That's <laughs> that's populations dying out if you set your recruitment rate too high. Um, trying to model this over different rates of recruitment uh, and a relatively low mortality rate uh, shows that after 30 years, uh, yeah, this system could still sort of work. Uh, you still get recruits. Uh, the population has still has some potential to grow up to a uh, recruitment rate of about 15%. However, if you continue this for 100 years, then the hotel situation runs out of control and uh, this is not something that is feasible uh, in the long run because over 7% uh, recruitment, uh, then the population will just not grow anymore. Well, uh, basically, uh, what I found doing this is, first of all, that these models are quite tricky to make. Uh, one of the things that happened was the natural reproduction in the model was higher than was expected. Uh, even if I applied high mortality rates, then I would still have 1% uh, growth. So perhaps the fertility rates used were not correct, but yeah, where is the evidence then? And if you look at this, and you also see that, uh, first of all, you need to balance the recruitment uh, to the fertility. Uh, obviously, the lower the recruitment, the larger the population you will need. But if your recruitment rates are too high, then the population will crash. Uh, based on this very crude model, a stable recruitment where the population would be sort of slightly growing would need about 80,000 people, which is way above what we uh, estimated before. But uh, like I said, the model is very sensitive uh, to initial assumptions, so I'm not too sure about the realism of this. Okay, so basically that's it. Uh, yeah, these are basically questions that we have left. Uh, how do we actually relate settlement numbers to population size? Is this useful at all to have these large ranges of, uh, of estimates? And then in terms of demographic processes, how can we improve our uh, understanding of what actually happens on the ground? I think we're just at the start of that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>